Welcome to the Third Realm Integration Podcast, where our unconscious minds meet and the transformation begins. I am your host, Megan Kenny. Let's get started. up everybody back for another episode of the trip show third realm integration podcast trip i'm going to talk about something that i believe to be the biggest trip of our entire existence here as human beings on this place called earth and that is the finite reality of our physical existence as ruled by time. So I'm going to break that down in a very simple way. And here's the caveat that I want to put out. This, I encourage everybody to listen to this episode until the end. Because while I am going to start out by lining up how therapists experience time, I am also going to connect it to the experience that every single human being on this planet faces when it comes to time, what their relationship with time actually is, and what it means from an existential and transpersonal perspective. So think about what your relationship with time is. Do you stress about time? Do you worry that you don't have enough time? Are you always running late? Do you show up to things early? Does the nature of time create stress for you? And in that same vein, now I'm going to kick it up to the existential piece. When we think about what our relationship with time is, you want to know what it is synonymous with? Our relationship with our physical death. It sounds pretty dark because it kind of is. The difference between the earth school and every other, you know, quantum school out there and every other dimension, realm, or on some other planet is the fact that we are ruled by some universal earthbound rules and laws that don't exist elsewhere. Time, matter, which also includes money, free will, and suffering are the core components that make the earth school exactly what it is and makes it so special and unique and different from any other, I wouldn't even say astral because that's only kind of one plane of existence, but any other quantum realm of reality. And I think we all struggle with these concepts. I think we all struggle with the the finite reality of finances and money and the symbol in the tool that money shows up as in our life. I think we all struggle with time. Think about how many people you know, maybe even including yourself, that struggle with the aging process. Am I running out of time? Do I have enough time? And that goes right, that starts right from your every day, minute by minute, second by second experience of when you wake up and when you go to sleep and everything in between, all the way up to the existential understanding of time, which includes our last day in this physical body. This is not a dilemma that everybody faces uh, in this like vacuum kind of way. This concept of time and physical rule-bound experiences here on the, on the earth plane are, is so nuanced and so varied that I'm sure everybody listening to this right now can come up with their own flavor of how they relate to time in their personal life, in their professional life, and in their spiritual journey. Now, those of us that do the work in the transpersonal realm or in the realm of maybe quantum physics might have an even more complicated relationship with time than somebody who... uh, Mm, respects time maybe in a different kind of way, allows time 
to frankly have their way with them, surrenders or submits to time. I feel like those of us in the transpersonal space might be there in part because we have a really complicated, resistant relationship to time. And that it might not really be all that comfortable to stay in the physical reality of matter. And instead, we find some relief, we find some interest in being outside the constraints of time. Quantum mechanics going beyond the illusion of the time-space continuum. So I want to speak about this from my own personal perspective. I also want to speak about it from the perspective of a therapist in general because the concept of time is probably, in my experience and what I've read on different therapist blogs and heard from different therapists, about how they work with the concept of time when it comes down to the frame of the session, so the beginning and the end of the session, it literally poses its, itself as probably one of the biggest clinical dilemmas that a therapist could ever navigate. I cannot even tell you how many therapists struggle with ending a session on time, myself included. And there are so many different suggestions out there based on somebody's therapeutic modality on how they may reach the end of a session and how they may go about it. I've seen everything from no real wrap up to just like, okay, that's time. I'll see you next week to people using internal family systems to bring the end of the session up consciously. I've literally seen it go in a million different ways. I've seen people spend 10, 15 minutes preparing for the end of the session prior to its last minute. And again, I've seen people just kind of abruptly end the session. You know what I actually want to do? I'm going to play a clip. I'm going to play a clip right now that'll walk us into this. That is from my favorite movie of all time, Goodwill Hunting. Now, therapists probably really do end sessions like this, but I, you know, I have to kind of, I have to pay attention to the irony in this clip because I think it also is sensationalized and I think it highlights really the do's and don'ts, but maybe even the do's that might be considered the don'ts when it comes to therapy, ending a session. And also this clip has to do with terminating the therapeutic relationship. This is not just the end of the session. This is the end of their very last session. His therapist, Will's therapist, good old Sean McGuire, ends the, ends the session in a very unique way. And I view, I've done presentations in psychology courses before in my master's program where I've used a lot of clips from this movie, actually. So it's a, it's a two-minute clip. Hang in there. Listen to it. It's nostalgic for me, so I'm going to be listening to it right here in real time. But listen all the way to the end, and then I'm going to unpack this. Which one did you take? I was over at uh, McNeil. It's one of the jobs the professor set me up with. Um, I haven't told him yet, but I went, I went down there and I talked to my boss and my new boss. He seemed like a good guy. Is that what you want? Yeah, you know, I think so. Good for you. Congratulations. Thanks. Time's up. So that's so that's it. So we're we're done. Yeah, that's it. You're done. You're a free man. So, you know, I uh, hope we keep in touch, you know. Yeah, me too. I'll be traveling around a bit and it'll be a little hard. Hold on. I've got an answering machine at the college I'll be checking in with. So, if you call that, I'll get back to you right away. Yeah, you know, I figured I'm just going to put my money back on the table and see what kind of cards I get. Do what's in your heart, son. You'll be fine. Thank you, Sean. Uh, thank you, Will. 
You just violate the uh, patient-doctor relationship. Nah, only if you grab my ass. <laughs> So that is no, I got ads playing here. That is the final, final clip. That's that's the final that's the final therapy session that Will has with with his therapist. So there are so many different pieces to unpack there. But I think if you've watched the movie, you also saw that every session that Sean had with Will, he ended by saying, "Time's up." Right up until the very last session where they had built this incredible relationship with each other, where Will shows up as this resistant, defiant client who at times sat in utter silence for the whole 60 minutes, which is a, <laughs> which is a therapist's nightmare, and eventually opens up and has a completely transformative experience in that therapy room thanks to the relationship that that therapist was able to build with him as that therapist was able to hold the space for all of the resistance that this client, who was essentially mandated to therapy for, wasn't his choice. I mean, he obviously went willingly, but it, were, it was all the professors at MIT that saw his brilliance and also saw his self-sabotaging behavior and wanted him to work on that, wanted somebody to psychoanalyze him, try to figure this kid out. They send him to Sean McGuire, and Sean McGuire actually works with him in a very untraditional way. Non-traditional way is probably the best word. In kind of a radical approach, arguably unethical at times. And I think it's just kind of amazing to watch that as a therapist and see how the nature of that therapeutic relationship unfolded, how strong it was and how instrumental it was in bringing somebody's full potential out to move them past the blocks that were preventing them from being their best self in doing so in a way that was pretty direct and confrontational and no bullshit. And that's actually the bridge that created the transformation in the client was the direct confrontational approach. Now, I'm not saying that being confrontational as a therapist in therapy is always the best answer. In fact, that's kind of an old school model and has been the, the traditional model in very specific styles of therapy with very specific populations in the forensic world. You don't really see that as much anymore, and I do have to wonder whether or not that's part of the reason why uh, the mental health space has been so watered down, frankly, and is largely not very effective for folks. Maybe we need a little bit more of that. Maybe we have, maybe, maybe our therapists are a little bit too uptight, and they're a little too codependent, and they're frankly a little too empathic, and they don't know how to transition into the space of compassion, which is much more direct and much more able to allow the therapist to hold the client accountable because that all ties into the nature of the physical reality that we, reality that we live in, which is that we are ruled by time and space and matter. Things cannot go on forever. The real world doesn't operate in this compassionate or I, I would say em well, really compassionate too but this this soft empathetic way where it's just like okay because you're having a feeling we're going to tend to that feeling and we're not going to put any restrictions or boundaries around that that's not how the real world works real the real world comes with consequences and responsibility and that hits on all fronts time energy and money you have to be entirely responsible for your own behavior and you have to be able to manage and handle the consequences of whatever decisions and actions you make. Why should the therapy room be any different? In fact, what plays out in the therapy space is supposed to be a reflection of what goes on in real life. It's just that here we have a safe container to be able to actually teach somebody how to navigate life on life's terms. LOL. Life on life's terms. And so I think the movie, of course, it's a movie. And of course, it's like I said, it's going to be sensationalized. I think it, it really highlights this piece of like, what does time mean to us? And how do therapists incorporate their own relationship with time into the therapy session so that they can hold the frame of the session, which is all about starting the session on time and ending the session on time? 
the value of a therapist being able to do both start and end right on time, which is in, in an art, it, it is an art in and of itself that is so tricky to navigate, which is why I bring this up from the therapist perspective, because most therapists can't do this. And they try, they try everything. They go for consultation. They go for supervision. They read this. They do that. They try this. They try that. And still, you'll read all the time on therapist blogs. The therapists are like, I know I'm supposed to end the session on time, but I really struggle with this one because it is so much bigger than what we think it is. It's so tricky and it's so nuanced and it, and it says so much about the therapist if they are incapable of doing that, that it requires a deeper look in, in a more in-depth examination at the, of the patterns of the therapist. When the therapist can hold the frame of the session and start and end on time, there is great therapeutic value that they are offering that client. They are showing the client what it means to be in the real world. It doesn't really matter if the client's in a really deep, vulnerable, emotional state and you're approaching the end of the session. It is what it is. The session has to end. And that's being mindful and respectful of the client's time to not keep them longer. Mindful and respectful of your own time as the therapist to not, one, give away free therapy, but two, not give away your energy that you don't have to give. If you have a client right after the client that you're seeing and you go over time with the client that you're seeing, you're now taking away from the client that's coming next because you don't have time to get up and go to the bathroom and take care of yourself and get a drink of water so you can center and reset to be the best version of yourself going into that next session. And you also don't have time to write any notes that you need to write or schedule that client that you're seeing for the next session, which should be done in the session because that's part of the work. The notes are a separate piece that you, you have to do on your own time. But as far as like wrapping things up, getting the client in for the next week, you do that in the session. Now, I'm speaking from a place of complete humility with this, which is why I'm getting on the mic in the first place. Because this is something I'm not good at. And as I search high and low, and I read all these different perspectives from all these different therapists, and I'm just like, nope, that doesn't feel right to me. Nope, can't do it like that. Nope, don't like that suggestion. And I'm like, all right, how am I going to actually implement a system that feels authentic to me? So I was just like, I got to find out what's going on here on a deeper level. This is not just about a solution, a solution based idea where it's like, I have this problem. I have trouble ending the session on time. I know from a clinical perspective as to why it's important because I also want to teach the client boundaries. And if I, can't, if I can't hold the boundary of the session, how the hell am I going to teach that? And then you wonder why clients end up, you know, going beyond the bounds of the boundaries. Well, because you're, you're not holding them. So you're sending an unconscious message that boundaries don't really need to be honored and respected here. So then this is how we co-create our own reality. Then we're finding ourselves in situations where maybe clients are pushing boundaries. I, I really don't have too much of that at really at all these days, but I, I couldn't be surprised if it did happen because if I can't hold the frame of the session, I always, almost always start on time, like exactly right within that first minute. But I'm finding like this last week, I started one session three minutes late because what happens is in Zoom, I have a waiting room. If I have to jump out and jump back in to end the session that I'm in with a current client, but I have somebody in the waiting room, when I jump back on, it takes a full minute to sh for that client that was in the waiting room to show back up and tell me that they're in the waiting room so that I can actually let them in. So I'm back by a minute anyway. So I'm starting a minute late. One day it was three minutes late, which to me is unacceptable. I'm always right on time. Ending on time is a different story. I struggle with that one. Because I always, it's my codependency pattern flaring up that I have a really hard time bringing something to a close, which brings into question, what is my relationship with endings? And it has been, it has been complicated my whole life to then be able to end something while somebody's in a vulnerable state. And if I'm not comfortable doing that, and I'm not, because I work with a lot of clients with trauma histories, and you have to make sure that you're shoring things up so they can now go out into the world, not as an open wound. So it is clinically responsible to make sure you're tying things up. It, but you have to give yourself enough time to do that. That's the issue. And I've been underestimating the amount of time that it actually takes to shore things up when clients are in a vulnerable state. 
And, and that's, this is what I do. It's vulnerability work. So I can't ask somebody to go into the depths of vulnerability and then the clock strikes, you know, the 45 or 50 minute mark. And I'm like, all right, time's up. Gotta go. No, it can't, that can't happen. So what do I do? I let it go on for a few more minutes. And then I've, there have been times where I've been caught where I'm like, hey, I know we're in the depths of this right now, but I'm really sorry. We really do have to end session right now, though. I'm sorry for this being abrupt. I will follow up with you by email, and I'll provide you some resources that you can explore over the upcoming week to help you take this work into real-life practice. But And that's like the best that I can do, which is pretty good, but that means that I'm now rushing to jump off that session. It's done abruptly. That doesn't feel good either. So... When a therapist has a problem ending the session on time from an existential and transpersonal perspective, and I just read an article about this the other day, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is because the truth hurts. It really stung a little bit to read this article. And what it said was that therapists have resistance to accepting the finite reality of death. Any therapist that has a hard time ending a session has a complicated relationship with death. And there is a part of them that will not accept death as a reality. And I would say that is probably true for me. Add that to the fact that I have, have had complicated, I uh, have had a complicated relationship with endings in general, which is tied to, which is stemming from the same reason, a resistance to death. Now it's all making sense. So now I read that and I'm like, okay. This isn't now just about a behavioral modification that I have to make to begin implementing a firm end time to my sessions. This is way bigger than that. And I am not going to tolerate allowing myself to play out my own unconscious wounding patterns into a therapy session that is definitely having an effect on the client. And me allowing that session to go on longer than it's supposed to if I believe that the client wants the session to go on longer, maybe that's one, maybe that's one thing. Maybe the client maybe does want the session to go on a little bit longer. I'm not taking advantage of the client in that moment as much as if the client has somewhere to be, wants that session to end on time, and I'm in the position of authority, and I'm still talking, or I'm asking deep questions too close to the end, they're answering, and then as a result, we're going over. I'm exploiting that client in that moment. That's not okay with me. So as soon as I went to the deeper level with it and I saw that this is actually an expression of my own resistance to death, I said, wait a second, this is, no, this is not fun and games anymore. This is not a joke. And I have to say, I actually had a client call me out a little bit on this last week. And I am beyond grateful to that client for bringing it up and saying, oh my God, we just went over by seven, eight minutes. And I'm like, yeah, we did, we did, we did. I need to get better at that. And that's actually what prompted this whole deeper investigation into like, what is really going on here with me that I can't end the session on time? And you can't blame the client. That's not an acceptable space to go into. It, it literally doesn't matter whether or not that client is just talking straight through and has been for the last 30 minutes. It doesn't matter. You're running the session. It is your responsibility to end that session. Just like you can't charge a session for ex- charge a client for extra time if it goes over session. You can't do that. You're taking advantage of the client. You are responsible for that frame. You are also responsible for facilitating deeper insights in that session. But you are responsible for that frame first and foremost. The client is going to run where the session goes and how deep we go. And I can, I can give my reflections and I can prompt for a, a deeper exploration. That client may or may not go there. I have clients that... I go deep and they go shallow. I go deep, they go shallow. It's, it's a very interesting dynamic when you see that play out. Those, those sessions tend to really end on time because you're not really in the depths. But if I'm leading somebody into the depths and they're going there with me, it is my responsibility to know when it is time to come back up to the surface. When I am supposed to direct them into grounding back into this physical reality, acknowledging time and space, and giving them time to prep so we end in a, t- in a way that feels good. So as soon as I saw that this was a deeper issue, this wasn't just about, nah, you got to get better with time management. No, it is bigger than that. It is way bigger than that. 
So I was like, okay, now this is serious. Now we're going to broach this as a very serious issue because that's exactly what it is. This is not just the, because therapists will make excuses. Well, it's okay. I have, I have a little extra time. Well, the client showed up five minutes late. I'm going to give them an extra five minutes at the end of the session. No, 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 no. Doesn't matter when that client shows up, that session still ends on time. And frankly, it doesn't matter when you show up either. If you're late, that, that session is still going to end on time, which calls into question your ethical responsibility because now you're taking advantage of the client's time. They're ready. They're ready to work and you're late and you're going to rob them of the few minutes at the end, which you would have to do anyway because you can't go over that. You got to look at that. So I'm good at showing up on time, but I haven't been as of late. In like the last couple sessions that I had, I started like a minute or two, one, three minutes late because I'm like rushing the previous client off because the previous client went over by 13 minutes. No, 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 no. We cannot be doing this. This is, no, we're getting into the, to the, to the muddy, 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 muddy waters. So what I'm going to try this time around, and I already started this last week. I already started putting a timer countdown timer with an eight minute, um, warning to myself on my phone before the end of session. So trying to give myself eight minutes to wrap things up. I'm finding it's not enough time. I also don't like the fact that I'm doing it on my phone. So while I pick my phone up to hit the end of the timer, it just looks like to the client that I am getting a phone call. And when you do telehealth, when you do teletherapy, it's a different, it's a different ball game. When you are in person with the client in the session, there are all sorts of nonverbal cues that you can give to signify that we're coming to the end of session. You can swivel your seat and turn it back towards your desk, start opening up your computer and bringing up your calendar to book them from the next session. You can look up overhead and look at the clock to check the time, which is oftentimes typically behind where the client is sitting. That's an indication that, oh, the therapist is looking at the time. We're getting close to the end. You can do all kinds of things. You can start distracting yourself and breaking eye contact and breaking out of the zone to send a message to the client that we're now at the end. You can't do that in teletherapy. It's you're looking at the screen, they're looking at the screen and that's it. And so you look down at your phone, they're just going to think, well, she's getting a phone call that she just hits the button and whatever. And so I started doing that on my phone. It worked the first day. It stopped working after that. And part of it was because I wasn't even paying attention to the timer anymore. I was just dismissing it and not registering it in my head that now we have to transition. So I have a couple new tricks up my sleeve that I'm going to try. I have a watch now that will be set with the timer. It will go off. I will lift my wrist. I will look at the watch to indicate that I am checking the time so I can send that message to the client that time is now coming back into this space as something that we must consider. Another thing that I'm also going to try is I'm going to use symbolism. I am actually going to communicate a message to the client's unconscious mind to prepare them in a nonverbal way for the end of session. And so I have a light, a lamp in my, the back of my office that I have a remote for. And I'm going to click that light on. So as the client is looking at my screen, all of a sudden a light goes off in the background. And what does a light symbolize? Consciousness. It's an awakening. It's now let's wake up from the depths that we were just in and come back to this physical reality, which is ruled by time and boundaries and limitations. So now let's prepare for the end of the session. So I'm going to give this a little bit of a try. I'm going to try a 15 minute mark, which most therapists give a five or a 10 minute heads up that we're coming to the end of session. I don't like that because it still doesn't give us enough time to use the transition into the final minutes of the session as a therapeutic intervention in and of itself. It still feels like now we've shifted away from the content of the therapy and now we're coming to the end and it feels disjointed. It feels, it feels fragmented and disintegrated. I want it to be an integrated experience. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to signal to the client and also verbally communicate that we're coming to the end 15 minutes before we do. And then I'll do my little wrap up as to how I encourage the client to now bring what we've just talked about into the upcoming week 
and a couple things that we can check in about next session when we begin. And that'll be enough time to allow the client to go deep into that, make the bringing up of time, the ending of time, a therapeutic intervention in and of itself. And then you leave the last, you know, two, three, up to five minutes to book for the next session. And then, you know, the fear of the therapist is that like, there's going to be nothing to talk about if there is too much time left over. So let's say you can't really strike it, it, it exactly right. Let's say you start wrapping things up 15 minutes ahead of time. And then all of a sudden the client doesn't have much to say, but you still got 10 minutes left. Well, you're a therapist, you know how to stimulate a conversation. So now you take advantage of that time to bring it full circle for the client, reflect back to them. Some of the things that they talked about in session that were notable, jot down a couple things that we can expand on further next session even provide some suggestions around how this client could bridge what we talked about in the session into their everyday life over that next week, some of the things they could focus on. I often send resources to people to help them deepen the experience. So I might have an idea, well, I could send you a resource on this if you want to check it out, or I could send you this and you could check this out or read this or whatever. So trust that you can continue to stimulate that conversation if there is a little bit of a window Do your part now to help sum up the importance of what just got reflected in that session. So that client knows that you were really there with them. You, you went in, you went in deep with them and you're retaining everything that they said. And then maybe even jot down a couple notes, a couple key words that will, you know, trigger a solid memory for you as the therapist next session that ties back to the previous session following up on some of the homework you gave or whatever. So I think when we come back to a place where we can recognize what our resistance to time and death is, we start to see how it's actually showing up in even the smallest areas of our life that otherwise just seem like simple problems with simple solutions, and that's not what's going on. So I encourage you to think about what your experience is and relationship is with time and death and how that is playing out in your everyday experience. Think about all of the ways in which time shows up and death shows up for you. And I don't just mean like, you know, people in your life passing, or you worrying about like, are you going to get hit by a car today? I mean, take it bigger. Every day, every breath is a step closer to death. What's it going to be like when you get on your deathbed? Are you going to have regrets? If you died tomorrow, would you be happy with how your life went? Or there, or is there still a lot of unfinished business that you would like to get to? The truth is, is we never know when the last day is. It could be tomorrow. It could be 50 years from now. Don't waste time. Live your life to the fullest and whatever it is that you feel like you're here to do and you want to accomplish by the time it's a wrap. Get to it. Don't stall. Don't wait around. Do not waste the precious gift of time in life because when it's over, it is over. You might come back for another lifetime. You might jump back into another body. But the soul that you have right now that is living in your physical body is not happening again. This one's going to be a wrap. So make it, make it count. Make every minute count. Time is precious. If you're somebody that runs late for stuff, pull it together. Knock that shit off. Because time is precious, including yours. Yeah, it's disrespectful to everybody else who's sitting around waiting for you. What about your time? And this goes back to the input-output thing that I talked about in one of the last episodes around what your worth is. Energy in time is the same thing to me. What's your energy worth to you? Are you wasting it? Are you giving it around all willy-nilly to just anybody? What are the boundaries that you have around your time, your value, and therefore your worth? And let's get real about this shit, you guys. This is not a life to be wasted that you are living right now. And if you are wasting time and you are wasting energy, then you are wasting your life. 
So I'm talking to myself right now. I'm really coaching myself right now as I say this out loud because I need to hear this too. So I'm with y'all. It, this is not easy, but it is important to do. This is important work. This goes way deeper than what meets the eye. And it's something that we need to hold precious and dear as human beings because this is what makes our life so special. So that's it. I'm off, I'm off my soapbox today. That's it. I'm going to wrap it up. I will check you guys in the next episode. And as always, may the light always lead your way. Be well, everybody. third realm integration podcast and related content is intended to provide information and or entertainment only and is not a substitute for mental health or medical advice diagnosis or treatment do not delay mental health or medical consultation or substitute a mental health or medical professional's opinion because of what you heard on this show seek the advice of your physician or another qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a mental health or medical condition the host of this podcast does not provide emergency support for mental health or medical issues For questions or concerns, visit your local emergency room or contact your doctor.